Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to another episode of Nerd RX podcast and I'm your host uh, Barka. Today we have Megan Knuth who is going to talk about one of my favorite techniques and that is multi ESI. Welcome Megan to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Awesome. Um so could you introduce yourself and tell our listeners a little bit about your background and what uh you do in the lab and what got you to this uh point in life? Yes. So I am a cancer epigenetics postdoctoral researcher at UNC Chapel Hill. Um, Prior to working at UNC, I was a graduate student at NC State, where I earned my PhD in toxicology. I graduated from NC State in the summer of 2020, and I immediately began working at UNC. So I've been at UNC for just over two years now. Um, As a postdoc, I'm really interested in the role of developmental vitamin D deficiency in programming of cellular energy metabolism. And I work in the collaborative cross mouse model. But what I'm going to be sharing with all of you today is a bit about my graduate research experience, which was actually in a zebrafish model. And Mm -hmm. I was really interested in understanding how more adult life exposure to vitamin D deficiency could promote obesity in a fish model. So now I work in mice and I look at developmental programming. So it's a bit of a shift from what I did at NC State. Yeah, like I would imagine zebrafish, I knew they have been used quite extensively, but they're like so small. And that is so fascinating that you could get so much information from such a small creature. Oh yeah. So, um, Actually, the zebrafish model has been around since the 1930s. And yes, they are a very small model. Um, An average adult is only about two centimeters in length. So you can imagine the different layers of complication that you can face working with such a small model. And actually, you know, when you're looking at an exposure, so a toxicant exposure, in my case, Um, actually was my exposure was vitamin D deficiency. You promote stunted growth and Mm -hmm. adult fish can be as small as one centimeter in length. So all of our tissue characterizations, all of our tissue collections, everything had to happen under a microscope. And to run things like gene expression, protein analyses, um, anything where you have a required amount of sample input, We actually had to pool multiple fish, sometimes upwards of four, to create Mm -hmm. a single biological replicate. And so Mm -hmm. let's say we wanted to look at um, PGC1-alpha and the adipose tissue. We had to use at least 16 animals per um, experimental group to get enough cDNA across Mm -hmm. enough biological replicates to actually measure gene expression. So it was a little bit challenging in that sense, but it was also a really fantastic model because compared to your more traditional lab models like mice, rats, and flies, zebrafish are actually the cheapest, most effective means of rapidly generating a robust population that can be manipulated to model human disease. Um, Zebrafish have actually been used really successfully to model um, human cardiovascular disease, kidney disorders, neurological conditions, and metabolic diseases such as insulin resistance, diabetes, and obesity. So for us, it was a fantastic model for determining whether vitamin D deficiency could promote obesity because we knew that the model was a successful obesity model, and we were also able to generate thousands of animals across 10 distinct populations and reproduce our phenotype 10 times. So at the end of my five years as a graduate student, I had worked with thousands of zebrafish. And so that's one of the huge strengths to the model is because if you're trying to reproduce a population over 
a t or, or I would say um, reproduce a phenotype over several populations, it's a the perfect model because you have one spawning, you have a thousand offspring already. Oh, wow. I can imagine because my current work involves mice and even with one experiment, when you try to divide them between males and females and then different subgroups, it can get quite expensive there. Oh, yeah. So in a zebrafish facility, you can think of it like a pet store. In the sense that when you walk in, you hear all of the water system running, you see all of the tanks. It's honestly quite beautiful in a way because uh -huh. you see all these fish just swimming happily in symbiosis with their environment. I just found it to be kind of a, a really fun environment to work in as a graduate student, you know, really getting my hands wet, so to speak, in an animal model. And then working in fish, I felt like kind of stepped me into my role now working with mice. Right. Um, mm -hmm. As students, what's a little different with the zebrafish than the mouse model is when you're working with mice, you have a whole vet, vet staff. And, yes. and they're all and all of these techs and they're all really trying to make sure that the mouse facility stays up and running they check on your mice every day for you. In addition to obviously you checking on your own mice, you always mm -hmm. have this backup. In a fish facility, you are the sole person responsible for everything, making sure that oh, the wow. equipment is operating, the tanks are mm -hmm. clean, the fish are fed, the fish are happy, snow, sleet, hail, doesn't matter the, the weather condition. It is your job to get in there to check on your fish. So it was quite a learning curve going from, you know, undergraduate and working in more of cell culture based models to a fish model where now I am the sole care, uh, caretaker of thousands of fish at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. But I do think it really prepared me for working with mice. Right. And this might be a complete naive question, but are there like, do you separate your zebra fish based on sex? We only separate our fish based on sex when we're getting ready to mate the fish. So okay. zebrafish do best if they stay in um, mixed sex environments because the exchange of hormones in the water mm -hmm. actually help prepare the females for reproduction. So if you okay. separate your males and females out, which is something that we tried, you actually get lower fecundity and rate of reproduction than if you keep males and females co-housed. Because to spawn, which is what we call mating in the zebrafish world, mm -hmm. the night before you want to mate your fish, you actually put them in this special spawning tank that has a wall. Mm -hmm. And on each side of the wall, you split up usually around three to four females on one side and one male on the other side. Because these males are very dominant. And mm -hmm. you only want to mate one male with several females, kind of like trio breeding in the mouse world. Mm -hmm. So they need to stay together in this isolated tank overnight. And then the morning that you want to um, mate, you actually, and this is, this is going to seem wild to people who haven't worked with fish, you need uh -huh. to prop your tank up at a 45 degree angle. Uh -huh. You remove the wall and this 45 degree angle creates a shoreline. And so when the fish are mating, they will drop their eggs or embryos, I should say, up towards the shoreline. Mm -hmm. So when you go to collect your embryos, they're underneath this grate up at this, you know, artificial shoreline. And that's how you end up generating your offspring. So after, you know, four to six hours, you go back down to the fish facility and you take a, a really um, wide bore pipette and you suck up all of your embryos and you put them into Petri dishes and you actually grow up your offspring for the first week of their life in an incubator up in the lab. And then you bring them down when they're hatchlings and you put them into um, tanks with stagnant water until they're a little older and eating larger grain foods. So you start them out with a really small powdery food. And then as they get older, they have, get larger pebbles. And then you put them into the main system. Mm 
um, when they're about a month old, and then you grow them up. And that's how you just continue to produce generations and generations of fish. So when you're starting a fish lab, if you have a starting line of fish, let's say you have wild type zebra fish. So like AVAV is an example of a wild type zebra fish strain. You can keep generating population after population after population of zebra fish without having to order any additional fish for unless you want to bring a new strain in, you could start with your founding strain and continue to breed those and never need to buy more fish. We never bought fish one time when I was a graduate student. That is so fascinating and so fast as compared to mice. Oh yeah. They're a lot yeah. less expensive. You can yeah. generate a much larger population. Um, that's why I think there's a pretty substantial community moving towards that model. And actually having worked in both, I really see the pros and cons to mice versus zebra fish. So to give you an example about a pro with mm -hmm. mice versus zebra fish is when I was a graduate student and I was really interested in obesity, we needed to collect adipose tissue from these fish and measure differences in gene expression. And adipose tissue was a particularly challenging sample to collect because zebra fish by nature are not fat fish. Mm -hmm. We knew that vitamin D deficiency in our model was promoting obesity. So in our vitamin D deficient fish, we had tons of fat that we could dissect out, but our okay. control animals stayed very lean. So yeah. generating enough adipose tissue sample from our control animals was extremely challenging. So we weren't sure early on how we were going to measure lipid metabolites because you need like 100 milligrams of tissue in some cases to, to run a lipidomics experiment. And we were never going to get that from our control animals. So we were thinking about maybe trying to measure these metabolites in blood samples, but we found that actually collecting blood from these animals was nearly impossible because they were so, so, so small. So this is kind of what segued us, you know, and led us to IRML DESI mass spectrometry imaging because we had to get over this, this issue of essentially, you know, not having enough fat from our control animals. So you know, eventually we arrived at IR Maldesi to measure metabolite profiles in single animals and circumvent this whole issue of lack of, you know, sample size and fat in our, in our control animals. Wow, that's really awesome uh, that how much information can these tiny creatures give us. So... What is multi ESI? Just straight jumping into the topic here. Yes. So I'm going to give you what the acronym stands for, and it's a mouthful. Mm -hmm. it, yeah. <laughs> IR MALDESI MSI stands for infrared matrix assisted laser desorption electrospray ionization mass spectrometry imaging. Mm -hmm. And so we were first introduced to IR MALDESI. Um, by the metric core at NC State. So I'm going to give you a little bit of history before I explain to you how this technique works because I think it's really yep. important to highlight the founders mm -hmm. um, because IR Maldesi was actually developed by Dr. Dave Muddyman's lab at NC State back in 2006. So we are really proud of this method. Yeah, you were like in the thick and thin of this technique then. Yes. And funny enough, I actually had not heard of this method, even though it had been developed at NC State, I had not heard of it until I ran into this issue of needing to identify a method that could help, you know, circumvent this problem of not having enough fat in all of my animals. And I think that's how sometimes we are introduced to our our greatest techniques is by having a problem that we need to solve and getting creative with how we're going to solve that problem. And so when I was at NC State, my PI at the time, Dr. Seth Coleman, 
knew Dr. Muddyman pretty well. And he works as part of, as I mentioned previously, METRIC, which stands for Molecular Education Technology and Research Innovation Center, which is a really important mass spec center, amongst other things, at NC State. And so Dr. Um, Coleman and I, we started to kind of communicate and collaborate with Dr. Moneyman's team um, over within Metric. And that consisted of um, Dr. Mons Ekloff, Whitney Stutz, and Ken Gerard. So all of these people um, really helped us develop our experiment um, and get introduced to IR Maldesi. So the reason why IR Maldesi was such a big, I would say, breakthrough in mass spectrometry imaging and such a big deal to NC State was because this is the first technique to ever utilize hybrid ionization. So in IR Maldesi, you're combining laser ablation with electrospray ionization. And so this hybrid ionization uses what we call a resonantly excited matrix to enhance the desorption of neutral analyte molecules. And so to give you some nitty gritty details about how this works, is you have this infrared laser that excites the molecules present in your tissue. So mm -hmm. in our case, this was a whole body zebrafish section. In other cases, this might be, you know, um, a brain tissue or liver tissue in isolation. But we were interested in whole body. And so what happens is when this infrared laser excites the molecules present in your tissue, those molecules are essentially now removed from your glass slide in a process known as desorption. And now mm -hmm. these molecules can be ionized by electrospray ionization into the gaseous phase. And so as I mentioned previously, this technique combines laser ablation with electrospray ionization. And electrospray ionization is really the key component of IR Maldesi MSI that makes it unique. Electrospray ionization is the softest ionization technique, which basically allows you to measure whole um, lipid metabolites or you know, covalent structures rather than fractionated products. And so during electrospray ionization, you have high voltage that is applied to a liquid to create an aerosol, which helps get your particle, your molecules into the gaseous phase. And so within electroionization, you have two modes. You have positive mode and you have negative mode. In positive mode, the oxidation of water produces protons. And in this mode, we detect protonated and or um, alkali addict analyte molecules. And then in negative mode, we have the reduction of water, which produces electrons. And in this mode, we can detect deprotonated analyte molecules. And so once these molecules are essentially created, they become ions in the gaseous phase, as I mentioned, and then they'll pass through an electromagnetic field and be separated by mass spec and then we can detect and analyze them using their mass to charge ratio. And so this was a big deal because prior to this, the only technique that had been established for mass spec imaging that came close to achieving this level of detail was MALDI, which you may have heard of, which yeah. is essentially just the matrix assisted laser desorption ionization without the electrospray. So here you're combining MALDI with ESI. Like I remember I have always studied them separately, but combining this was like the big deal here. Yes. It was um, the, the real push towards combining was really so that we could move away from having to essentially piece together fractionated products and really detect the parent ion. And you mentioned uh, that MALDI is a soft technique. That means it does not fragment the things you're looking for further into smaller pieces. Am I right? Yes, yes exactly. Okay. Okay. Awesome. And how did you, um, like when you used this technique in your zebrafish model, were you 
able to get what you were looking for? Yes. So I think it's important that I touch on how we went from a zebra fish Thanks. to measuring lipid metabolites. Because mm-hmm. when we stepped into the game, we knew that it was possible, yeah. but we didn't have a method. There was no method. Um, everything that the metric group had really done prior to us, you know, stepping in was in isolated tissue. So brain, bone, heart, liver, and a lot of mouse work. Mm -hmm. Because in mice, you get these really nice, large tissues that would be really easy to embed in section. But we wanted to look at an, all of the lipid metabolites across an entire zebrafish. So what this really allows you to do is look at the spatial, why IRM Aldesi is so wonderful for lipid metabolite detection, I should say, is because it allows you to look at actually the spatial localization of these metabolites and the abundance and how these metabolites change in abundance depending on the tissue that they're in. So we could look at the same, let's say we were interested in cholesterol across the whole body of the zebrafish, we could look to see, oh, is there a difference in the liver versus adipose tissue depots? Um, You know, we had a lot of interest in endocannabinoids. We were able to look at the difference in endocannabinoids between the gut, the brain, the liver, adipose tissue. It was incredible. But before we could do any of this and, and get any of this amazing data, we had to develop the method. And so for those of you interested in the me- method we developed, I'll um, go a bit into that. But you can actually reference the entire method for um, sectioning and running mass spec in whole body zebrafish. If you go to the American Society for Mass Spectrometry, go to that journal. And in 2020, we published the paper Methods for Cryosectioning and Mass Spectrometry Imaging of Whole Body Zebrafish. And you can actually see the entire protocol that Whitney and I developed to eventually run this mass spec imaging in our whole body fish. And I will make sure I have the link for that paper in the description. Yes. And I will also provide you with um, a paper that Muddy Mints Group came out with in 2014 that goes into the nitty gritty details of how the IRML DESI actually works. And that paper is called IRM Aldesi Mass Spectrometry Imaging of Biological Tissue Sections Using Ice as a Matrix. And so those are two really um, important papers, I think, if you're trying to plan an experiment um, and you need a little more detail on the actual method. Perfect. And so um, if you're interested, I can tell you a bit about what it takes to go from living breathing zebrafish in a tank to the spatial localization of all the lipids in its body. Yes, please. All right. So the very first thing that I think I want to just say in brief is that the main goal of preparing your sample for IR Maldesi is getting what is called a cryosection. And that means that you have frozen down your tissue and you have sliced a beautiful cross section that you can lay on a stage and analyze. So how do we do that? Well, the first thing that we had to establish was the correct embedding media. And so there was a lot of trial and error trying to figure out what are we going to embed the fish in? So what are we going to preserve the fish in where it will stabilize it so that we can actually create these cross sections. What we ended up using was a 5% carboxymethylcellulose, 10% gelatin embedding media. In our protocol that I mentioned, we have the specific catalog number down to the exact supplier where you want to get your CMC and gelatin. We tried a number of different percentages and a number of different manufacturers and found that there was only one type of gelatin that was stable enough for us to embed our fish in and take these sections with. So that's an extremely important detail that we worked out that anybody who wants to work with zebrafish needs to follow 
or you're never going to get these sections that you need. So once you have your media prepared, you then have to euthanize your zebrafish one at a time, keeping the whole body intact. So I think it might be interesting to mention that the way that we euthanize zebrafish is actually by placing them into chilled water. So you take a beaker of water and you put it into a four degrees fridge overnight and you cool it down. The morning of, you put that water on ice and when you take a fish out of its tank and put it into this cold water, you will have completely euthanized the fish in less than 20 seconds and you have not damaged any of the tissues or any of the structural integrity of the fish at all. So that was okay. one, a very, very important aspect to this study if we wanted to get these beautiful cross sections of the whole body was that we did not damage the integrity yeah. of the fish. And so once you've euthanized your fish and you have your media prepared, you're going to need peel away molds, which basically is a small plastic mold that is about a half a centimeter in depth and about three centimeters in length. So just large enough to fit your fish, essentially. So then once you have your fish laid completely flat in the basin of this mold, and I'm talking like fanning out the fins, making sure it's flat as a pancake, then you can pour your hot embedding media over your fish. And once you've done that, you make sure that the fish is totally covered, the whole basin is full of this embedding media. You then have to take forceps and manually pop every single bubble in that media because if you have any bubbles at all, mm -hmm. your sections are going to crumble. Okay. And so that was a really important step. And it's, it's surprisingly challenging in such a tacky embedding media. So I found that the best way to pop your bubbles is to actually pluck them out of the media. Mm -hmm. Rather than trying to actually stab them to, to yeah. pop them, you have to actually mm -hmm. take forceps and pluck your bubbles out of your media. And these are the little details that we hammered out and realized made all of the difference. And so once you have your fish embedded, the bubbles are out. The next really important step is how you freeze the fish and the media down to create a solid homogenous block. And so the way you do that is you take a one-to-one -one ratio of crushed dry ice and 95% ethanol, and you create an ethanol bath. And so you take your peel-away mold with your fish, and you set it into a little aluminum cup, kind of like a cupcake tin. And you, you put the aluminum cup, and you actually float it in a styrofoam cooler on this dry ice ethanol bath. And you put the lid onto your cooler and you just let it float for 15 minutes. And in that amount of time, it is so cold in your styrofoam cooler that you, you will completely freeze down your fish into the embedding media so that you have this homogenous block. And you'll know when your media is totally frozen because it's going to go from this like tacky white gelatinous material to a solid white block. Wow. So once it's frozen, you just take your peel away mold out of this aluminum cup and you just pop, pop this block right out and it'll all stay intact. And then you're just going to use some OCT and glue your fish to your specimen disc, which will go into the cryostat. And all I'm going to say about the cryostat is that it's essentially just a fancy giant blade within a temperature controlled instrument that allows you to collect the parasagittal serial sections at a defined thickness. So for IR Maldesi, you need your thickness to be about 16 micrometers. And once you've collected your section, you immediately lay it onto a glass microscope slide. And then these slides can just be maintained at negative 80 degrees Celsius in a freezer until you're ready to run the instrument. And so all of that to say is what Whitney and I spent a lot of time doing before I actually was able to run my experiment was we had to go through and establish all of these individual steps and all of the specific details mm -hmm. before we could actually run any, any you know, IR Maldesi work mm -hmm. on our fish. Mm -hmm. 
So a lot of trial and errors on your part, but I think you have established a basic protocol for anyone who wants to use zebrafish and IR Maldesi. Yes, and I am happy to say that we have heard um, that this protocol, this method we developed, has successfully worked for other labs wow. in other parts of the world. And so yes. it was worth, you know, the long, long, long days and the blistered hands cranking mm -hmm. this cryostat, trying to figure mm -hmm. out how we can get the best sections. I mean, we found out little things like a cryostat has a light that helps you see your sections. If you have the light on, it changes the temperature of the cryostat. It warms it. And so you get a false reading as to what your temperature setting is. And it's too warm. Mm -hmm. And it'll cause your samples to melt. So you have mm -hmm. to suction with the light off. And we determined wow. the perfect environment for inside your cryostat and the right size specimen disk. I mean, it was the first time I've ever really done what I would call true method development, where you're not just changing a couple volumes, you're starting from nothing. And yeah. you're trying to figure out how to get to this, this ultimate endpoint. Yeah, and it looks like you have not left any stone unturned because other people are able to replicate it, which is yes. the biggest issue most people run into when you read something and try to replicate the same experiment. And most of the time it never works. Yes, I was lucky that I came from a lab where you wrote everything down and mm -hmm. every single detail mattered because there have been many times where I've tried to go to a paper and I've even tried contacting authors because following their published protocol, yeah. I can't get the experiment to work. And then I'll reach out and I'll find that like really important steps were totally right. left out. And I can only imagine how many people have been in that same situation that I've been in before where you're, you, you know, you're doing everything you can to get something to work and it's just not working and you don't know yeah. why. Yeah, like you mentioned, just a simple thing like turning off the light in the cryostat, you would not think that's important, but it makes a complete difference. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, we only learned that because we were like, okay, we know that we have the best embedding media we possibly could have for this. We've done everything up to this point. We, we've gone through fixing all of those steps. So why are we getting... Why is our embedding media going from this beautiful, crisp, sharp block, basically, to this tacky substance? What can we do differently? And the only thing we could change was turning off the light. So we're like, let's turn off the light. Let's try this again. Let's see if we can get the temperature to stabilize better. And it worked. Wow. That's and amazing. so what we were able to do once we, you know, got through the protocol is we were able to take my experimental fish and we were able to use a small sample size, I mean, six fish per treatment group in the mouse community. That's like your max number usually in the fish community. That was a really conservative number because if you think back to what I was saying earlier, sometimes I would have like an N of four that would technically yeah. be One. 16 fish. Yeah. So to really only be using six fish for treatment group was like a miracle because this gave mm -hmm. us the opportunity to run the whole experiment. And if something didn't work out, we still had a, tons of fish. So I was like, mm -hmm. this is fantastic. So mm -hmm. once we were able to run our fish, we were able to discover all of these new things about vitamin D deficiency and the metabolites and the, and the metabolic pathways that vitamin D is interacting with that we would have never discovered had we not have ran this experiment. Mm -hmm. Wow. And so, I mean, I have this, I have a paper, if you guys are interested in it, that was published in Journal of Lipid Research called Vitamin D Deficiency Promotes Accumulation of Bioactive Lipids and Increased Endocannabinoid Tone in Zebrafish, where we, we go through our discoveries from this experiment and we found for the first time that vitamin D deficiency actually promotes the accumulation of these bioactive lipids, which is, is anything from fatty acyls to triglycerides to diacylglycerides, bile acids. And we were particularly also interested in vitamin D derivatives. So we talked about that a little bit. Mm 
And what we found was that we had a, a very significant increase in anandamide, not only accumulation, but what appeared to also be synthesis because we had this increase in the anandamide precursors as well in our vitamin D deficient fish, suggesting to us that we have increased endocannabinoid tone in our zebrafish. And what was most, I think, exciting to us is we had this obese phenotype in our vitamin D deficient fish, but we didn't necessarily have a mechanism as to why. We had looked at all of your traditional markers of obesity and saw that they were increased in the vitamin D deficient fish, but we didn't know what was stimulating that, that fat storage. But when we looked in the literature and looked into anandamide and what anandamide does, it actually is directly linked to obesity. It does favor fat storage. It is associated with this like increased um, bioactive lipid accumulation. So it was like all of these light bulbs were going off and it actually, the findings from this paper were the foundation to a, a new incoming graduate student's entire thesis work. So it was just like this one experiment, you know, I don't want to say life changing, but it really did change the direction of research in Seth's lab and also open up all of these new possibilities for the importance of vitamin D and how detrimental vitamin D deficiency can be for the system. Because I think there's a lot of misinformation out there about how if you already have healthy levels of vitamin D and you take more vitamin D, the studies show it doesn't prevent you from disease, okay? But that is extremely different than being vitamin D deficient and not having healthy levels of vitamin D and then taking supplements and improving your health. Those are, it's like apples and oranges. And I think mm -hmm. there's a lot of misinformation that vitamin D supplementation doesn't help. Well, it does if you are vitamin D deficient, because when you don't have enough vitamin D and you're not properly activating the vitamin D receptor and you're not properly regulating these really important pathways of energy metabolism and bone synthesis and even neurological development, things go really badly for you. And so we were able to basically show that the endocannabinoid system, which is pretty well studied when it comes to the relationship between, you know, um, the development of like things like schizophrenia, Parkinson's disease, et cetera, well, we were able to link the endocannabinoid system now to vitamin D deficiency. And that was huge. I work with endocannabinoids. And I had no idea. <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, a lot of times you think of endocannabinoids exclusively in the brain, but they yes. actually play a huge role in the yeah. gut. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think one of our research, like a new uh, grant we are working on is between the gut brain axis mm -hmm. and how, uh, the gut bacteria like influence a lot of things that are happening in brain. So it's yes, everything is connected to say the least. But only now I think we are realizing the potential that it doesn't mean that neuroscience is just the brain. No, you have to take the entire organism as a whole to mm -hmm. treat something. Yes. And that's really what we were trying to do with this whole body imaging, because, you know, we were really interested in looking at this, you know, the liver, adipose, pancreas, what we call the visceral cavity of the yeah. zebrafish. We were really interested in that. We have all the data from the brain that I didn't even touch because you know, you can only study so much as a graduate student. And once you start getting outside of what I would call my comfort zone, which is the visceral cavity, which is all your really strong metabolic organs. Once you get out of there, you have opened up just so many possibilities. And so we have a student right now, or I should say not we, cause I'm not in the lab anymore, but Seth has a student <laughs> right now who I work with very closely and she is going with me to the vitamin D workshop coming up to share her research on 
the neurological implications of vitamin D deficiency. And she works in, in zebrafish, obviously, but she looks at how when you are vitamin D deficient, you have these big changes in behavior, you're more anxious, you know, and they are ultimately trying to link all of this to maybe what was happening with the endocannabinoid system in the gut region. And so that's kind of that gut brain axis you were talking yeah. about. But she's very focused on the neurological component right now. And then another student will have to come in and try to associate <laughs> the two. Oh my God, that is really commendable that you were able to basically start this entire research and now it will go to places like you, we don't even know what will happen next. That is something I love about research. You find something and you pass it on to the next person and so on and so forth and it never yeah. stops. Yeah, it's really amazing. And I'm hoping that, you know, I work in mice now, but I see a future for me probably merging the two models and maybe dabbling in a bit of both. Because I think if you have a, a small question that's mechanistic and you want to quickly answer it in a robust mm -hmm. population size, the zebrafish model is fantastic. If you're looking at more of a, you know, human disease progression timeline where, for example, I'm really interested currently in fatty liver disease and hepatocellular carcinoma. That would be a hard model in zebrafish because their lifespan is a lot shorter. In a mouse model, it will go under, you know, your mice will undergo the stages of basic steatosis to more cirrhosis phenotypes, for fibrosis, and eventually hepatocellular carcinoma. So you can look at the different developmental stages of this liver disease in mice similar to what you see in humans. You wouldn't be able to do that in zebrafish, but say you have a very specific question, does differential methylation of gene X, is that the biomarker or the major change that's occurring developmentally that is promoting this progression to fatty liver disease? Well, then you could use a zebrafish model to target differential methylation of gene X and see, are you developing fatty liver disease in a very short period of time. And so I, I really see the benefits of both. And I really hope that I can use my two different backgrounds and merge them for a strong research program in the upcoming, you know, next couple of years. Because the goal for me is once I'm done at UNC is to go on and, and run a lab as research faculty. So I'm still always trying to take and bring my graduate work back into my current project and with the hopes of developing a really strong independent research plan that bridges these models. Mm -hmm. Wow. I, I'm pretty sure you're going to make an amazing professor. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, I really appreciate that. That's the goal. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a tough world out there. There's a lot yeah. of grant writing involved. And <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is the grant writing part is something I don't like about academia. But other than that, it gives you the freedom, the flexibility to just look what's out there. You know, just you have your own ideas and just go with it. I love that. Yeah, about. and it gives you this opportunity for like unexpected discovery. Yeah. I would say mm -hmm. that what I got out of my experience with Ira Maldesi was unexpected discovery. I had hypotheses going into it like triglycerides, for example, I had done a basic, you know, biochemical bench top analysis to look at differences in triglycerides in my fish. So I had a hypothesis about having elevated triglycerides in the vitamin D deficient fish, but I never ever would have foresaw my research going into the endocannabinoid system. And now mm -hmm. I think about it all the time in my mouse model, because Again, you never read about the endocannabinoid system in an obesity paper, but yeah. I know now from my work that it, that is a target and, and that could be a really interesting um, kind of research path that I could maybe yeah. get my toes back into. Yeah, that's awesome. So let's talk about something you don't like about IR Maldesi, is there anything? 
Yes. So I will say, and I'm sure with your mass spec background, you can agree with me that some of the major disadvantages are not only the expense, like you need to have a really well-defined hypothesis and good experimental plan because mass spec is not something you want to just play it around with. Um, For IR Maldesi, because you run it in positive and negative mode, a single sample takes six hours on the machine. So if you're running 24 samples, you're looking at at least a month just to go through and collect your data. And that's if there isn't high demand from other research labs at the same time. So if you have, you're trying to, you know, fit your experiment in and they already have a bunch of people in the queue. I mean, your samples could sit in the freezer for a couple of months before they even start to get analyzed. Then once you have the data, unless you come from a mass spec lab and you're really familiar with raw mass spec data, you need a collaborator. So we collaborated with Whitney She's phenomenal. She's still with Metric at NC State. Um, And she helped get the data into a software called MSI Reader, which was developed by Ken Gerard. MSI Reader is not like anything you've ever worked with um, coming from outside of this mass spec imaging world because it is a it is a data it's a software that's run through MATLAB and it is specifically for looking at these ion distributions across your samples. And so you need training in how to do that. So after I, you know, had my samples ran, I got the training from Ken. It still took about eight months of Whitney and I working together to analyze all of the data. So it is not an experiment that you throw in at the last minute just to get some quick data for a grant, for example. This is a major effort. Um, the types of, I would say, data processing that goes into, you know, point A to point Z when you're when you have this beautiful table of lipid metabolites you're ready to publish includes having to measure the differences in metabolite abundance across samples. It takes a long time to take, you know, first when you upload your fish into MSI Reader, first you have to tell it, you know, which metabolite you're interested in. And if you don't know that yet, you first have to extract all of the metabolites found within that fish. Then you have to go through and identify all the metabolites to figure out what you're even interested in. Then when you want to look at abundance, you have to tell MSI reader to target a certain metabolite to measure the abundance across a region. And then you normalize it to background so that you aren't picking up any noise. And then finally, you arrive at a single value. Well, if you're doing this for 24 fish, you're spending a very long time on the computer extracting all of this data. And you're getting, there's so much data you get out of this. That's why I say it's important to have a hypothesis and know what you're interested in. Because mm-hmm. you're getting thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of metabolites. And if you just, if you're just exploring with no phenotype, yeah. you're not really sure what you're looking for, like you might spend a lifetime in this data. So once we had all of our metabolites that were significantly up or down regulated in our vitamin D deficient fish compared to controls, then we were able to spend quite a bit of time going through the literature using things like um, Metaspace and some other platforms. Uh, Metlin is another one. And you use these platforms and you use the mass charge ratio and you use structural information and chemical formula and lipid class, and you start to understand what these actual metabolites are, and then you find different isoforms potentially of the same metabolite. And so you want to find the parent, you know, isoform and the parent compound and focus on those depending on what your your interests are, and then also look at all of the subtypes. So like, there's a lot of triglycerides. You don't want to just present like two triglycerides if you actually have 25 triglycerides. So you have to go and identify all of your triglycerides. So it takes a really, 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 really long time to go through the data. And I would say that that was the biggest challenge for me. I mean, I came in with an issue I needed to solve technically. Then I ended up needing to develop the protocol to get to run my samples on the um, Maldesi. And then after... We had to develop the pipelines to really analyze the data because, again, we were working with the whole body of the fish 
rather than a specific tissue. So the amount of data we got was just astronomical, which is a wonderful, wonderful thing, but can also be very overwhelming, which is why we ended up defining what I called earlier the visceral cavity as our region of interest because I could not possibly venture into the muscle tissue, the brain, all of those, the heart, all of these other components because I would have spent a lifetime just analyzing the data. That would be two PhDs. Yeah, that would be two <laughs> PhDs for sure. And we started this, I would say we started this in 2018 and I was slated and to graduate in 2020. So I needed mm-hmm. to get out the door. Um, and of course the pandemic came as yes. I was writing my thesis and I had to defend during a pandemic. And so a lot of this analysis work had to be done at my house and mm-hmm. you need a really high processing computer to run MSI reader. You can't, you can't run it on a Mac laptop. Mm-hmm. It does well on a very high performing windows computer desktop. And so I had to go into the lab and I had to bring all of the lab computers, the everything home, the hard drive, all of it to my house. And then I had to get special permission to remotely connect to the server at NC state because it's too much data to store locally. Mm -hmm. So it was quite the operation to get me to the, to the defense state because right as I was wrapping up the analysis, the pandemic came, everybody was told they had to work from home. And I, here I was needing all of this special, you know, computer equipment to finish analyzing the data. Yeah. And so getting this paper out, getting this, you know, that was such a big deal for me because of all the hurdles I went through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it took at least eight months, you know, like I said, from getting the data to to getting it put into my thesis and fully analyzed. And luckily I, I, I made it happen, but it certainly was no small feat. And so I think that like, that's something you really want to think about before you run an experiment like this. Do you have somebody who can dedicate all their time to this experiment? Will it help you answer a really important question? What is that question? What is your hypothesis? And then do you want to look in the whole body or are you only interested in a single tissue? Because if you're only interested in a single tissue, don't put yourself through the headache of having the whole body. Yeah. Yeah. So I think the main point here is, uh, of course, know what you're doing because this is not a technique you explore with because it Mm -hmm. might add up quite a bit. And also this is not something that every lab will have in-house. It has to be on a bigger scale where it is obviously shared between a bunch of people and a bunch of labs. Right. So right now, Maldi, I believe, um, which is like the the parent to Maldesi, mm-hmm. I would say that the Maldi came first. Yeah. Um, that's a little more readily accessible. More core facilities have that. But to this date, unless something has changed since I graduated back in 2020, NC State is the only university with the IR Maldesi up and operating with a core facility that is dedicated to running that instrument. Wow. Wow. Even UNC doesn't have it? I'm not sure. I'm not mm. sure. I mean, this really, there were there was a big team that I didn't even acknowledge all of that went into mm-hmm. developing this platform and the software. And so I think that NC State has really kind of held on to it because yeah. it's so valuable. They have mm-hmm. collaborations, of course, all over the place. Um, but I think that most people who run IR Maldesi ship their samples to NC State. Yeah, I think it's easier to collaborate than setting up something you have no idea what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, things can go wrong. You have to know how to troubleshoot it. Mm -hmm. It's expensive to fix. You need to have the funds to maintain it. You're always calibrating. I mean, sometimes it amazes me how many labs don't calibrate their instruments regularly (laughs) or don't fulfill the service contracts. Like you can't mess around with IR Maldesi like that. You have to be constantly taking care of it, cleaning it, calibrating it, Mm -hmm. getting it serviced. Like it's not because if it goes down and you've let it go and you haven't been taking good care of it, I mean, 
you might not get it back up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Is there any fun fact about IR Maldesi? I think that this, the, my favorite part of Maldesi would be my fun fact because it's, the images you get are just so beautiful. Like imagine taking a cross section of a fish and instead of seeing tissue, you see this array of the most beautiful, I would say rainbow of colors. And every color has a different abundance value or what we would call intensity value. And it will group, like if you have a metabolite that is only found in certain tissues, you actually can see the outline of these oh. tissues being created just by the intensity of the lipid metabolite with them. So you can see the brain, you can see the heart, you can see the liver, you can see the intestines. It is just so beautiful. That's, mm -hmm. that's probably what I value the most is like, these are like awe inspiring images you get out of it. It's really fun to look at. It's really fun to read about. And it is a lot of fun to analyze because of just the visual appeal out of all of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of time you are just analyzing a bunch of numbers. That is not fun. Yeah. So, yes. yeah. Well, I think my next question was about some interesting papers and you have already mentioned quite a few. So I will make sure that I link all the papers in the description. And with that, I think that is it for this episode. Uh, thank you, Megan, for sharing this wonderful experience you had uh, in your life. Thank you so much for having me. This was really fun. And it gave me the opportunity to get super excited about my graduate work again. And I loved it. Well, thank you so much. And for the listeners, I will catch you next week for another episode. And if you have any suggestions on what topics I should cover next, please send me an email at barka at nerdrxpodcast.com. And remember, it's good to be a nerd. Bye.